410. And before we actually read God's word and hear him speak to us through his preached word, I invite you to join me in prayer, asking that God might have us hear that which he has for us this morning. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before you thanking you and praising you, Lord that you reveal yourself in a special way through your preached word. So we ask that you might do that this morning, Lord. Lord, we understand that we often in this world face angry foes and anger raised up within us, Lord. So help us to see how Jesus calms anger. Lord, help us to see through this text of scripture why we wanna follow Jesus and not seek our own preferences. Lord, I ask you to be with me, your servant. Let the words I speak be not my own, but your words placed in my mouth to edify your people and turn hearts to yourself. And all that's preached this morning, Lord, may you accomplish your purposes. For we ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen. I invite you again to take a look at Esther chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, a portion of scripture which shows how foolish demands create anger for others and for you. So give your attention now to God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Fashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs, at this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Derek's just 19 years old, and he's facing life in prison. What happened was some young man disrespected him, didn't do what he said, so Derek shot him dead. Got angry, lost control, let his anger get the best of him, and in the process, threw his life away. Can you relate? You ever do the same sort of thing, get angry, lose control? It's very common in both the world and the church for people to have anger rise up. It is so prevalent today, you can hardly find a person, home, or church that doesn't battle anger in some way on an almost daily basis. So if you're here this morning and you're facing an angry foe or you struggle with anger rising up within yourself, then I've got good news for you. You're not alone. And through this message, you're going to see how Jesus calms anger. He provides the help and the hope that you need. So let's do something. Let's walk back into ancient Susa and see how King Ahasuerus lets his anger get the best of him. Gets enraged because his new bride disrespects him, tells him no. We come to the conclusion of the wedding feast and we see how anger takes over, as it so often does with us. And that's why this message is driving home how Jesus calms anger. Here's what I want you to see this morning as we look at this text. First, merriment can make you foolish. Second, foolishness makes unwise demands. And third, unwise demands bring anger. And this brings us to the point of the text, which is the point of the message. Get this down. Whenever you face anger or find yourself becoming angry, hear these words and apply them. Jesus calms anger, so follow him. So first, merriment can make you foolish. You ever find yourself where you just need a break, just want to have a good time, blow off some steam as it were? These things happen, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. God says it's okay to take a break, go to a party, maybe even have a glass of scotch. He says these things are right. Because what does Jesus himself do? He takes a break, right? Gets away from his disciples and all the people and gets some rest and refreshment. It's okay to do those things. And so no offense to our Baptist brethren, but God does not say you can't go to a party, can't dance, and can't have a beer. In fact, Scripture itself shows you there's nothing wrong with alcohol. Psalm 104.15, speaking about God's great provision, here's what it says. God gives you wine to gladden the heart of man. And in 2 Timothy 5.23, Paul tells Timothy, No longer drink only water, but take a little wine for your stomach and your ailments. This is showing how it's okay to take a break, blow off some steam, have a party, and maybe drink some bourbon at night. Nothing wrong with doing that. But be very careful how much fun you have and how much alcohol you drink. Because scripture doesn't just stop with those verses saying wine's okay. It also gives you some warnings. Psalm 75, 8 says, For in the hand of the Lord is a cup of foaming wine, well mixed. 
This is comparing God's anger with too much wine, with drunkenness. Puts it in a negative light. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk with wine. So when you put this all together, what are you seeing? You're seeing it's okay to go and have a good time, okay to have a party, have a beer, but where you be very careful how much you drink and how much fun you have. See, when you have your focus on having a good time, blowing off steam, and ignoring your responsibilities, it can cause you to get very foolish. And that's what you're kind of seeing here, how it can basically take over and lead you straight into trouble. Because you're seeing right here how merriment can make you foolish. Look at verse 10. Look how it begins. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine. This is giving you a picture of what's going on here. And it's driving home how merriment can make you foolish. You've got King Ahasuerus who's doing what? He's at his wedding feast. It's been going on for a whole week. But it doesn't start here, does it? You've got to think back to a couple weeks ago, before study leave, when we were looking at that great feast he was having. Remember the six-month bash he was having? Because he wanted to get all his nobles, all his servants, all his military to follow him so he could take over Greece. He wanted to go against the Greeks and take them over, expand his kingdom, make it better. But he knew he needed more people than just them. He also needed all the people of Susa. So what did he do? Right after he's done six months of partying, he has a week-long wedding feast. And throughout it all, He's got wine just flowing freely. And what you see right here is his wedding feast is coming to a close. When it says on his seventh day, that's telling you the week is over. And how do we know it's his wedding feast? Because where is it taking place at? Again, it's taking place in the palace gardens. That's where weddings usually took place. And what they usually did was they didn't celebrate for one night. It was a week-long event. So you got King Ahasuerus out in the palace gardens doing this week-long event which is why all experts agree this is no doubt his marriage ceremony to Queen Vashti, his new bride. So you got him on this six long feast, six month long feast, followed by this week long wedding festivity. And what's happening the whole time? He's drinking, drinking, drinking. This guy's answer for a hangover is to stay drunk. That's what you're seeing right here. And how do you know that? Look at the language again. It says, when the king's heart was merry with wine, this guy's hammered. That's what's going on here. And as you know, when you're drunk or you're fuming mad, you don't usually make the best decisions. People who get drunk, you know what happens? It's why young people wind up with tattoos and next day regrets. Man, I wish I didn't do that last night. And that's what happens when you let alcohol take over or you let anger take over. That's what you see right here. Merriment can make you foolish. And King Ahasuerus' command shows this so clearly. Look how it begins. Look at verse 10, how it goes on to say. Here's what it says. It says, He commanded Mehuman, Bizda, Harbona, Bigtha, and Agabatha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus. This is driving home and making clear how merriment can make you foolish. And it's not just with wine. You can be drunk on wine, but you can be drunk with power or pride with your possessions. You can be drunk on thinking, look how amazing I am. Look at all I have and how important I am. I'm the big cheese. Everybody needs to listen to me. That's what's kind of going on right here. You got King Ahasuerus, this very powerful and wealthy king who's got so much resources that he can sit back and party for six months and follow up with his lavish wedding feast for another seven weeks. And you see he's got seven eunuchs that are serving him. Now we're going to get to a moment why it's seven matters, but I want you to notice something else here. You've got seven names here, seven eunuchs. Each one of these guys is specifically named. That's kind of curious to think about. Why would they be specifically named? I mean, they're nobody significant. In fact, other than being here in Esther, you'll never read about them anyplace else. And this is very common in the book of Esther, to have names that are listed. And you've got to ask yourself, why is that the case? Why does God want us to know these names when, quite frankly, they're nobody spectacular. They have no real significance. You know why it is? Because we can easily read over these names and just move on to verse 11. But I want you to stop and think about what's going on here. God is showing you how he uses ordinary folks. See, it's showing that these people, these seven eunuchs, they're just like each and every one of you. Ordinary folks that God uses to bring about his extraordinary plans. Look, I don't want to upset anybody here, but i got some bad news for you. You're not a bunch of superstars. You're not going to be the next American Idol. Nobody's building buildings saying, i got to put your name on the side of it. And I'm guessing there's no world-renowned authors coming to you, knocking on your door saying, i got to write your story. I think I've been making a bestseller here. Not happening, right? 
But that's okay. You know why? Because it's okay to be ordinary because God uses the ordinary to bring about the extraordinary. And that tells you, you have great value. You're no less important than the Apostle Paul or John Calvin because God uses you. I want you to let that sink in. Really grasp that. We always are seeking to be extraordinary, above and beyond. Well, God says what? Do what he calls you to do. Be content to be ordinary, to live everyday ordinary lives, knowing that God will work through you to bring about his extraordinary purposes. Because how does God bring people to saving faith? Through you. That's why Jesus calms anger. Because you see right here, seven guys are named that have no real significance. They're just working their jobs. Isn't that what you do throughout your days? Just go to your job, nothing spectacular, ringing up the groceries, cleaning the floors, crunching the numbers. What's going on? That's what God does through the ordinary. Jesus calms anger because he wants to be able to use you to fulfill his purposes. So think about what Jesus Christ does. God is angry with your sin. You realize that? Every sin you commit makes God angry. Not just the extraordinary ones, even the everyday ordinary ones, like losing your temper and saying something unkind and nasty to somebody. That condemns you to an eternity in hell. But what does Jesus Christ do? He goes to the cross and dies to purchase your pardon, sheds his blood to cleanse and purify you so you don't stand accountable for your sin. No longer condemned. Because through Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation. That's the reality. That's what's going on. That's what you're seeing right here. That's why Jesus calms anger. Because he knows the consequences of it. Realize there's things you can do, like Derek, that you can't take back. Words you can speak that can leave real wounds and hurts. Scars that last and go on. And when you sin, God is angry. So what does Jesus Christ do? Hear this loud and clear. Jesus propitiates God's wrath, appeases his anger, calms him down so that you can come into his presence. So God can use you in your ordinary existence to bring about extraordinary purposes. Isn't that good to know? You don't have to be spectacular. You don't have to be seminary trained. You don't need your PhD or your doctorate. You can be an ordinary person with a high school graduation that God can use in great and mighty ways. Right where you're at. By what you speak and how you live. But it can't happen when anger takes over. So Jesus calms anger so he might be able to use you as the ordinary means to bring about God's sovereign purposes. Because what does he do? He conquers sin and death, rises from the grave to do that, and then ascends on high and sends the Spirit to indwell you. So you're equipped, enabled, and empowered to face all angry foes without freaking out, and also to prevent your anger from rising up and taking over. That's the beauty of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ and you face anger or you yourself get angry, then understand something. You need to come to Jesus. That's the answer. So do that this morning. Cry out to him. Say, I want you as my Lord and Savior. And watch what he does and how he calms God's anger. And you stand no longer condemned, but one who's been set free. One that can be used by God to bring about his purposes. Why does he do this? Because he knows we're all going to face circumstances, situations where we're going to get angry. We're going to want to fly off the handle, lose control, and even face people doing that. And notice how that often happens when you're just having a good time. You ever just having a good time and someone comes and messes it up and makes you mad? They take the last piece of pizza and you're like, that was mine! What are you doing? And anger starts flowing, right? Merriment can make you foolish. So that's why Jesus calms anger. He wants you to live soberly, clear-headed, clear-minded, thinking upon what he says and what he does. Because that gives you a whole different perspective. So when you face anger, you're not just thinking, I want my way. But you're focused on Jesus and his way. Because he understands merriment can make you foolish. So be very careful about how you spend your time. Because when you have too much fun, too much alcohol, too much focus on yourself, it can make you to do unwise things which make people angry. So Jesus calms anger. So follow him. And you're going to need to know this because you're going to face insulting demands. Things are going to make you mad. Which brings us to our second point. Foolishness makes unwise demands. If you were king of the world, what would it look like? If you were suddenly queen and all the power, what would you require? What would you say your loyal subjects had to do? Would you be saying, you need to be in worship every Lord's Day, you need to be in God's Word every hour, you must be in prayer regularly among God's people? Would that be what you were focused on? 
If you want to know what you would do, then ask yourself, what do you do with your life right now? What do you do in your home? What is most important to you? You know what's amazing? Look at what we do with our kids. We focus on making sure that they're pleased, they have manners, they're polite, they say please and thank you. But where's the focus on God's word and prayer? Is that what's primary? How about what we do? We're never late for work, right? Got to be there on time. I can't go to church event because I get up early for work. And then we roll into church 10, 15 minutes late, like, ah, that's okay, God will wait for me. No big deal. And think about what we do. Never will we miss Aunt Millie's birthday party. Can't do that. But how many church events go unattended? Where's your focus? Where's your priority? That shows what matters to you most. And that shows what you would do if you were in charge. And that's why, quite frankly, we make foolish demands. Because we focus on ourselves and what's important to us rather than looking at God and what's important to Him. When you change your perspective and stop seeking your preferences and looking instead to God's desires, wanting His will to be done, it changes how you operate, how you think, and what you do. And that's what you're seeing right here. It's why Jesus calms anger, because He knows foolishness makes unwise demands, just like you're seeing in our text. Look at verse 11. Look what you see here. This is giving you King Ahasuerus' demand. It says, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown. Now, at first blush, this doesn't seem like a big deal, does it? You're like, okay, what's the big deal? I mean, it doesn't seem unreasonable, does it? I mean, after all, there's this week-long wedding feast, and he's in the garden palace while she is in the palace herself. Remember, they don't get together because when there's alcohol involved, these pagans didn't think it was a good idea to have men and women together drinking. If our college has followed that today, it'd be a good thing, huh? That's what they did back then. So maybe he's just saying, you know what, I just missed my bride. I haven't seen her before. I want to see her. Let her know how much I love her. Give her a kiss. Make sure she's okay. Now you've read the text, so you know that's not the case. But think about how often we do that with our unwise demands. The things we insist upon. And we try to do what? Make them look like there's pious and righteous reasons for them. Right? Don't we do this? We tell our kids, listen, you've got to eat all your vegetables and you've got to go to bed on time because I'm so concerned about your health. That matters so greatly, your physical health. And then what do we do? We put them to bed and then we stay up late watching all kinds of trash on TV and filling our face with cake and ice cream. So much for the health concern, right? And think about how we do this. We are God's people, chosen by God, adopted by Him as His sons and daughters that He brings into His presence that cares for you, watches over you, sends his son to the cross to die for you, to pay the price for your sins. He says, I'll give you all you need. I'm always here for you. You can pray for me anytime. And what do we do? How do we respond to Christ, what he does for us, what he gives to us, how he lays down his life for us? We make these unreasonable demands. We say our pastor, he should be available 24-7. You know what? I'm leaving the church. You know why? My pastor had the audacity to go on vacation and not answer my phone call. You believe that? Oh, that's nothing. Let me tell you what my church does. Let me tell you why I'm leaving my church. They actually held worship service, and they had people in the pew, and they didn't give everyone hand sanitizer. You believe that? Germs spreading everywhere. That's nothing. Let me tell you why I left my church. They had a festivity, some event, and they didn't even give us vegetarian options. You believe that? And worse than that, they let kids run in the church. Oh, the, the madness. These are the things we demand, right? Now listen, I'm not saying you can't have views and opinions, share your thoughts, have desires. But make sure you're very careful that what you desire is not just your personal preference. It's consistent with God's word. You want to tell your pastor what he's doing wrong? Let it come from scripture, not what your head thinks. You want to oppose your session? Make sure it's fitness in God's word, not some science out there in the world that's going to tell you what's best. Let God's word be your guide. Let that be what dictates the way you go. See, the reality is this. We are so good at focusing on our preferences. And most of the demands we make are done to do just that. That's why foolishness makes unwise demands. We ought to be focused not on our preferences, but Christ's promises. Try that. Let that be different. When you're facing a difficult situation, when someone's making you mad, look to God's word and see what it says. Look at Romans 12 that says, don't seek vengeance, but pray for your enemies. Give to those that don't have. Somebody wants to take your parking lot, say, hey, you can have it. Don't freak out and blow your... You jerk. Give up. Let's say you can have my spot. That's okay. I'll walk a couple extra feet. I got good legs. I can do that. That's all right. No big deal. That's what Christ does for you. Jesus calms your anger because he knows he wants you to be his representative, his ambassador, to show forth the world what he does. 
And when you're angry and freaking out, that is not a picture of Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, willingly laid down his life for you. Didn't get angry, but knew that God was angry. So he went to the cross and died for your sins. So don't demand your way, but insist on God's way. Seek his will. When you insist on your way, it is a recipe for anger. And it will quickly show you how foolishness makes unwise demands. And that's exactly what you're seeing here in our text. Look how verse 11 ends. This is now showing you why King Ahasuerus insists that Queen Vashti be brought before him. Look what it says here. In order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. This is the reason why King Ahasuerus is saying, I want my bride to be brought before me. Bring Queen Vashti and carry her in on her throne by the seven eunuchs carrying her in, wearing her royal crown. It's all about his power and his pride. He's got seven eunuchs carrying him in. What's he saying with this? What's he showing with this? The number seven is very crucial in scripture because it connotes completion or perfection. He's sending the message with his seven eunuchs, bringing in his lovely bride, who's very lovely to look at. Look how powerful and complete and perfect I am. How else can I get a woman like this? See what he's doing? He's not interested in caring for or shepherding his new bride. He's interested in showing her off, using her as a trophy wife, a show pony, saying, you should think well of me, because look, she married me. Aren't I amazing? That's what he's doing, trying to use her for his advantage, to try and get people to say, you know what, we should follow the king. We should follow him into war, because after all, look at the woman he's got. He must have something good going on. And it's so sad to hear, but you know what? We see the same thing go on in the world today, even in churches. Men who try to make themselves look good through their wives and their kids. So they try and scare and intimidate them to doing what they want, so they look like a good husband or a good father. Did you see my kids? They sat in church like this and didn't make a peep. Aren't I a good father? No! Let your kids know God's word. That makes you a good father. Hold out the scriptures before them. Praise them and discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's what God wants. Men, I want you to hear something. I want you to get this down. And ladies, just listen in in case your husbands aren't doing this. And kids, pay attention in case your fathers aren't doing this. Hear this loud and clear. Men, your wives and your kids are not your property designed to make you look good. They are a gift from God. That's why God's word says so clearly in Proverbs 19, 14. Listen to this. Listen to these words very carefully. Houses and money are from a father, but a wife is from the Lord. And Proverbs 18, 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And as to your kids, Psalm 127, 3 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And in Malachi 2.15, God says he brings together a man and a woman. Yes, a man and a woman, not two men or two women. Don't want to offend anybody, but that's not proper. It's a man and a woman. God joins in marriage. Why? Because he's after godly offspring. So he's not actually interested in your preference being met, people being there to serve you or meet your needs, but he wants you to raise your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He wants you to shepherd your wives so they know God better. That's the reality. That's why Ephesians 5, 30, 25 to 32 says, Husbands, love your wives, and listen to this language, and present them as holy and blameless like Christ does the church. That's a pretty huge responsibility husbands carry. Your wife is not there to meet your needs. You're there to shepherd her and lead her along God's path, not going her way because it'll make your life easier, but leading her your way, which is God's way. And how about your children? What does it say? Ephesians 6, 4. God warns fathers. He says, don't provoke your children to anger, but raise them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that's what you want to do. You know why? Because when you're focused on what God says, not your preferences, not going your way, you don't make foolish demands. Because you know Jesus calms anger. Because what happens when you make foolish demands, people are going to say no. That's going to make you mad. So follow God's word. Because when someone gets mad and says, why are you telling me to do this? Say, I'm not saying a word. God said it. Isn't that good to know? To say, you know what? It's not me. It's God. Talk to him. You got an issue? Take it out with God. Don't blame me. That's what you're seeing right here. See, the reality is this. God doesn't give us wives and children to make our lives easier, more comfortable, be less costly. 
because you don't want to cook your own meals. That's not why God gives you a wife and kids. He gives them to you as a gift for you to shepherd and love and lead. That's the reality. We need to understand this and get this down. So many men today are messing up the church and the world because they're letting women lead. We need to stop it. We need to stand up and be the leaders that God calls us to be, which means to shepherd in a loving way following God's word. Not just do it your wife wants because if she gets mad, my life is too uncomfortable. She won't make me what I want for dinner. I've got to make my own food. I've got to eat cereal then. I don't want that. We need to do, understand you're seeing here, we need to teach and enforce godly decrees. And then you'll see through that how Jesus calms anger. Because Jesus grabs your heart and changes it and makes you want to follow him, not your own ways. Doing anything else than following God and what Jesus says is just plain foolish. And foolishness makes unwise demands, which just provokes people to anger. Now I need to pause here for a moment. Because this text of scripture is hugely misinterpreted in so many ways. And one key way is, you've probably heard about this, a common misperception is that when Queen Vashti was told to be brought before the king, she was told to be brought naked, nothing on other than her crown. That is not accurate at all. And think about how foolish that is. How would that make any sense? They won't even party together if there's alcohol involved. Do you think he's going to have six guys have been drinking for six months say, oh, now let me show you my naked wife? He's not going to do that. That actually comes from rabbinical tradition that uses an exemplary approach to try and push forward a narrative. A narrative that says that this text is about female submission and modesty and it's against drinking alcohol. But that is not what this text is about. Understand when you hear these things where the source is. Don't rely on rabbinical tradition. Look at God's word. You don't see anything in the text saying she needs to be brought naked, do you? And it would make no sense. This text is not about female modesty or submission or anti-alcohol. It's about the dangers of letting anger take over and losing control. That's why Jesus calms anger. Because he knows the dangers. And it shows us something so key. It's showing us that when you're in charge, when you're a leader, that's when you most need to be sober-minded and clear-headed. I want you to hear this. If you're a pastor, elder, deacon, leader in a church, if you're a husband or a parent, a father or a mother, even if you're the babysitter, if you're some boss at work, you need to understand something. Your power and authority is derivative. It's not autonomous. It's derivative. It's given to you by God for the good of his church, his people, and his creation, his world. So exercise your authority that way. Don't do it as a tyrant, dictating, making all these unwise demands that just make people angry. Make sure what you do is what people need. Be willing to serve first, not just dictate and command. See, because what does Jesus Christ do for you? Doesn't he show you what it is to be a leader? Doesn't he humbly submit himself to his heavenly father, goes to the cross to die for your sins, submits himself to death, even death on a cross, so God's not angry with you. How amazing is that? Isn't that incredible to think about? That's what he does for you. He dies so you don't have to. He dies so you might live. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ. And think about this. We often miss this. But Jesus lays down his authority, his power, and his glory in humility. That's what leadership does. It doesn't exert itself and say, follow me, I'm in charge. But it says, my power is derivative. It's given to me by God for the good of those he places me over. Because Jesus Christ does for us what we could never do for ourselves. And quite frankly, what we'd never do for others. I know we like to say, I would die for my wife. I'd die for my kids until something happens. And we're like, oh, you know what? Go check out what's downstairs. I'm going to be up here. We like to talk, but do we live it out? What's the reality? Jesus Christ lives it out. Willingly enters into his state of humiliation. From his birth to his death to his burial in the tomb. All his estate of humiliation. And he does that for you. For your good. That's what leadership looks like. That's what you want to do. And that's why Jesus Christ calms anger. Because he wants you to understand. Hear this loud and clear. If you want to be a leader, then you need to first be a servant. Leaders don't just fall out of the sky. They start with serving. Serve your wife. Serve your kids. Serve your church. Serve your boss. Serve, serve, serve. And God's preparing you for leadership. I know we think you go to school, get a degree, and that makes you a leader. That does not make you a leader. The guy who puts away the chairs and sweeps the floor, that's the guy that God's making a leader. Because you're a servant before you're a leader. 
just like Jesus Christ shows. And that's why Jesus calms anger. Because we like to be the big cheese, the guy in charge. And Jesus says you need to be willing to serve first, to do what needs to be done. And he does this to ensure that you won't let foolishness make unwise demands, which only gets you and others angry. That's why Jesus calms anger. So follow him. You know why? Because when you make unwise demands foolishly, they make you and others angry. Which brings us to our third and last point. Unwise demands bring anger. I want you to think about a time in your life when you had an unwise command to, you know, forced upon you. Somebody wants you to do something that was contrary to scripture. Can you think about that? Maybe it was your parent, your mother or child, your mother or father. Maybe a teacher at school. Maybe a spouse, a boss, a neighbor, a friend. Somebody wanted you to do something that was really unwise, unreasonable, and quite frankly, ungodly. Did it make you want to follow? Or just make you mad and want to resist? See, the reality is, unwise demands bring anger because they cause us to want to resist, not to follow. And that's what you see right here in the text. When people make unwise demands, there's a tendency for us to get upset, not to say, okay, let me follow. And that's what you see right here with King Ahasuerus' command for Queen Vashti to come so he can show her off, present her as a show pony. Look how amazing she is. Aren't I great and wonderful? Because look at my wife. What is she? That's what he wants to do. He wants to show her off. But guess what? She's not having anything of it. She's not interested in being used for his amusement. So what does she do? She says no. Look at verse 12. Look how it begins here. But Queen Vashti refused to come into king's command delivered by the eunuchs. This drives home how unwise demands bring anger. It seems that the queen isn't about to be the king's show pony, be used for his amusement, be used to build up this support for him. She's not going to have that. And I want you to know something here. Her saying no is pretty serious. Notice the word that begins your text here in verse 12. It says, but. The whole movement is this guy's been showing the first 11 verse open about how powerful he is, how mighty he is, the great power, complete, complete, complete power he has, right? And now what do you hear? But his wife says no. And this is not an easy thing to do. You tell your dad no, you might get grounded for a week. She's not going to send out of the castle for a week. She could lose her head. She could be killed. And it's important to understand. You know why? Because in this life, you're going to face unwise demands that are going to make you angry. Unscriptural commands. Things that go against God's word. And you're going to have to have the power and the ability to stand up and say no. When your boss says, you need to work instead of worship, you need to say no. When your neighbor says, stop sharing Christ with me, I don't want to hear it anymore, you need to say no. I love you too much, care too much about you to let you perish and go to hell. When the governor says, you can't worship, it's not safe, you need to say no. God commands me to worship. I need to be there. And you know why you can do this? Because Jesus first says yes. When his heavenly father says, will you take humanity to yourself? Do for them what they could never do for themselves. Go to the cross and die. He says yes. He willingly lays down his life so you might stand up for him. He gives you the authority, the ability to say no to all unrighteous ungodliness. Why? Because he conquers sin and death by rising from the grave, ascends on high, sends the Spirit with all the benefits of redemption to get applied to you, but then that Spirit changes your heart, takes out your heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh, and makes you new. That's why if you're here this morning and you've never confessed Jesus Christ, I would urge you to do so now. Watch the power that Jesus gives you. He makes you new. Suddenly you can do things that you could never do before. Like say no to all unrighteousness, all ungodliness. That's what you see Queen Vashti doing here. Jesus dies so you can do just this. Jesus dies so you might live. And he gives you his spirit so you have all you need to say no to all ungodly demands, all unrighteousness. So when you face these things, don't get angry. Don't flip out or lose your mind and lose control. But look to Jesus and say no to all unrighteousness, all ungodly demands. And don't fear the wrath to come because you know Jesus calms anger in you and in others. So follow him in his word. Do this because unwise demands bring anger. Just like our text drives home. Look how verse 12 ends our text showing how enraged the king becomes. Look what it says here. At this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. What's this at this that he got enraged by? 
Queen Vashti saying, no, I'm not going to be your show pony. I'm not going to be used by you for your amusement or to build yourself up. And it highlights how unwise demands bring anger. It's not just Queen Vashti that's angry and upset that says no, but look about how angry King Ahasuerus becomes. Think about what's going on here. He's trying to make his case to his war council that all those before him know you should follow me into war because I am so powerful, so mighty, there's nobody can stand up against me. Imagine you're there. You're watching this. And he's telling you how mighty and powerful he is. Nobody will dare tell him no. Nobody can come against him or stand against him. And you get word? His brand new bride, one week into their marriage, says no. What are you thinking? Maybe not quite as powerful as you think, are you? What's it do? You know what's going on? You know what's going on? Why are you so mad? Why are you so angry? Because his pride has been wounded. His ego has been hurt. He's thinking she's undermining me. And you know what? This is something we need to understand. We need to see. Because here's the reality. We often think, as husbands, we have the right to demand whatever we want from our wives and our kids. But you don't. They're not under your complete authority. You're given to them by God to lead and shepherd them. So I hope if you tell your wife or tell your kids to do something that's ungodly, not consistent with God's word, they have the power to say to you, no. And they go to God's word. And this is why ladies and children, you need to know God's word. Make sure your husband, your father is leading you according to God's word. Not to their preferences, what they think should be done. I just think this would be best. Show me from scripture. Show me this what God really says. And you need this, you know why? Because we're always going to face these type of things in life. And we're going to stand up and say no. And we need to be able to do just that. Because people all around, they think that they're king. Right? What do you, what do you hear? King of the castle? I hate to break it to you, you're not king. You know who is? Jesus Christ. He's your one true king. King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the one you rule and reign under. Let that be the one you always look to. The one you always follow. The one you go to. Don't try and lead like an angry tyrant. And when you face angry tyrants, don't get mad and flip out. But understand, they need to be reminded who's in charge. Jesus Christ. See, because here's the reality. Jesus calms anger because he knows what anger does. How it brings foolishness, unwise demands. And your anger can have lasting consequences. Like Derek, you can do things you can't take back. Derek can't undo what he did. We sometimes speak words and guess what? You can't put them back in your mouth. You can do things, say things, wound people that leave lasting scars that never heal. You need to be very careful about what you say and what you do. Make sure it's consistent with God's word. And that's why Jesus calms anger. Because when we're angry, we're not thinking right. Jesus calms anger. Because he knows you need to be sober-minded, clear-headed. He wants you to serve him. And that's what happens when he calms you down. That's why Jesus calms anger. So you're not controlled by it. So follow Jesus Christ. Follow his decrees. Follow what he says, knowing things won't go wrong. Unwise demands bring anger. But Jesus calms things down. So follow Jesus knowing. Jesus calms anger. So follow him. Derek's much older now. And he regrets what he did. He can't take it back, can't undo it, and he's never going to leave his prison cell. But you know what? He's been changed mightily. He no longer is focused on people respecting him and doing what he says, but rather he's more focused on letting people know who Jesus Christ is, what he does, and what he says. It doesn't matter who he meets, guards, prisoners, guests to the cell, he lets them all know about Jesus Christ. Because he knows through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's been changed. And that's the hope that you have. Jesus Christ really changes you and makes you new. Makes you do things you never thought you could because he gives you his spirit. So you're equipped and able and empowered to go forth and stand against all unrighteousness, say no to all ungodly demands, and to walk along his paths and follow his decrees and do what he says. Because you don't do it on your own strength and power, but you do it through the power of the Spirit. And that's why you want to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't, then ask me about it afterwards. Talk to one of the elders. Talk to one of the mature people here. Say, how can I know this Jesus? And watch what he does. Because here's reality. You don't need... To do a, have a better plan, devise some scheme, find the right anger management program. What you need to do is like your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And humble yourself. Submit to Him. Follow His word and His ways. Do what He says. 
Because then, you won't be focused on your preferences, but you'll be looking at his promises. And you'll follow what he says. You'll follow Jesus' word and his ways. You'll do this because you know. You're going to face things that are going to make you mad. You're going to face angry people. And what you most need at that time is not to retaliate, not to be in charge, but to respond with humility. To respond with a clear mind, sober thinking. Do this knowing Jesus calms anger so you can live as you should. So follow Jesus. Let him calm your soul and bring you the peace that only Jesus brings. Get this down. Live this out. Jesus calms anger. So follow him. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning thanking you and praising you, Lord, that we know we often face angry foes. We, our, we ourselves, Lord, get angry. We get frustrated, upset. Help us, Lord, to have your spirit. Truly calm us down, Lord. Enable us to walk along your path, Lord, to stand up and say no to all unrighteousness. Help us to truly see how Jesus calms souls. So help them, Lord, to calm our anger. We ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen.